Our text for this morning is found in Luke chapter number 22. Luke chapter number 22. And if you would, stand with me for the reading of God's Word. We'll begin here in Luke chapter number 22. I mentioned the yard signs a moment ago. Those are limited quantity, and you can pick those up outside the west wing by the green tent. So we're looking forward to getting the word out for Easter. Luke chapter number 22. We're also excited about this new series, Courageous Love. And the first message begins here in Luke chapter number 22. Verse number 1 reads, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and the captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and coveted to him to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man greet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house wherein he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the service that we've enjoyed together. God, we pray now that you would speak to us through your word, uh, that as we see your love for us, we may in turn love others uh, as you love people. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you, Larry. Well, thank you for your prayers as we were away these last several days, and I had the privilege of preaching in four different churches and uh, these were churches in which each one had several West Coast Baptist College graduates, and we were privileged to preach the gospel, and in every service where we preach, see people accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, and so we praise the Lord for that fruit. We also had the privilege of ordaining one young man into the ministry who's a graduate of West Coast, who's going to be starting a new church in Sydney, Australia. As we were heading home, we uh, came through the country of New Zealand where we preached a Friday night evangelistic meeting. And as we were getting settled there, uh, the pastor that was driving the car told me the story of a missionary church planter who, in fact, is just starting their first church today. And he said, Brother Chapel, he said, the, uh, the missionary and his wife suffered a great tragedy several months ago. Their nine-year-old son was diagnosed with cancer and 40 days later, he went home to the Lord in heaven. And they said, uh, the family isn't too far off the path that we're traveling, and if you wouldn't mind, we'd like you to come by and meet them and have prayer with them. And so it was my privilege to meet Brother and Mrs. Garner and their children, and to hear the story of their nine-year-old son, Zeke. And as they were telling me about their nine-year-old who's with the Lord now, they began to literally praise God. And they said things like, we just praise God that we had, I believe it was 42 days with him from the time of his diagnosis until the time God called him home. We're so glad we had that time with him. And they said, we're so glad that Zeke was such a strong Christian because Zeke actually prepared us for what was about ready to come. They said Zeke spoke about uh, his faith in the Lord and his belief in heaven. They even said that at the very last moments of his life, Zeke opened his eyes and he looked up with a joyous look on his face as if anticipating seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. It was an amazing testimony from a family that had been through such a difficult trial not so long prior. As I was thinking about that conversation and about uh, the Garner's son, Zeke, and how he prepared his parents, I thought to myself how much this was like the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Lord 
Jesus, in the days and weeks leading up to the cross, spent all of his time preparing his disciples for what was about ready to happen. And this morning we're going to learn that true love is always courageous and it is always preparing those we love for what is ahead on their journey. We see this in the life of our Lord, even as Judas Iscariot in verses one through six is plotting to betray Jesus. Even as he is striking his deal with the chief priest and ready to sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, Jesus knew all about that. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ steadfastly prepares his disciples for what's about to take place. I want you to learn with me this morning about the preparation of courageous love. Notice, if you would, Jesus' love, first of all, in his loving preparation. He is preparing the disciples. Look, if you would, at chapter 22 of Luke's Gospel, and verses 14 and 15, the Bible says, And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Would you say those last three words with me? Before I So Jesus knows that Judas will betray him. Jesus knows the cross is just hours in front of him. And yet he says, before I suffer, I wanted to spend some time with you. Before I die, I was really looking forward to having this meal with you. Now here we see Jesus at the Passover meal with his disciples. And Jesus is expressing his love to them. Jesus is giving them a calming assurance by his very presence. And he says in verse 15, With desire I have desired to eat with you. In other words, he says, I've had a longing to be with you. Now, if you and I would have been in the same situation, we might have been wanting to cut Judas off at the pass or somehow uh, figure out a different route for the redemption of mankind. But that was settled before Jesus even came to this world, that he would die on the cross. And so rather than doing other things, he is with his disciples. He is there helping these frail men prepare for the death that he would face. These next 24 hours in the life of Jesus would be horrific physically, spiritually, emotionally, more than any human could bear. And yet rather than thinking of himself, Jesus was thinking of his disciples. Much like a parent who perhaps would receive a poor diagnosis of their health. Much like a mother, knowing that life has been shortened, uh, would begin to invest in her children and, and would tell them of her love and would assure them that she would see them again. Jesus is taking these moments with his disciples and cherishing every single moment. The Bible says in Hebrews 13 and verse number 5, For he hath said, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what men will do unto me. And Jesus is saying that to his disciples. He's saying, I'm with you. I'm going to go to prepare a place for you. And where I go to prepare a place for you, he says, Then I will come again so that you can be with me. Spurgeon said, I must confess that I never realize how precious Christ is until I recognize how undeserving and how hell-deserving I really am. And so Jesus Christ cared for his disciples to the very end. He expresses his love to them even though he was about to begin his suffering. And not only did Jesus express it, But Jesus illustrates it for his disciples. I want you to notice this in verse 16. The Bible says, For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for thee, or shed for you. 
Now, there are two suppers in the picture before us in verses 16 through 20. The first supper that is at hand is what we call the Passover supper. They are remembering their deliverance out of Egypt. And some of you recall the Bible story, how that the children of Israel were prisoners in Egypt, and how that God sent Moses to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said, let my people go. And, and, and Moses said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no, I'm not going to let the people go. And so God began to send plagues into their presence. And one of those plagues was a plague of lice, and there was a plague of flies, there was a plague of boils. And then there came this time when God said, I'm going to bring judgment upon the homes of this country so that every firstborn male's life is taken away. And God said, now Moses, he said, tell my people that if they will put blood on the doorpost, when I see the blood, I will what? Say it with me. Pass over you. And so the believing Jewish family posted the blood of an innocent lamb on the post. And as the death angel came through Egypt land, when God saw the blood, he passed over them and spared their firstborn son. The Passover feast then is a commemoration of God sparing the nation. And this is what we read about as they took the cup in verse 17 and as they broke the bread. And yet we see something else. We see also that there is another supper that is instituted here. And the Bible tells us in verse 19, He took bread and He broke it. He gave thanks and He gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. This is what we call the Last Supper, the Lord's Table, or sometimes we call it Communion. And as Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure, he gives them a way to remember him. And he tells them that this breaking of the bread, this pouring of the juice, is a way that he is instituting for his church to remember him after he is gone. One author said the deepest level of awareness of God is achieved only by intimate communion with his Son. And here, Jesus is creating a way for their communion. Two weeks from today, on March 24th, in the evening service in this building, we will distribute the bread and the juice, and we will have communion with our Lord. The bread does not give us salvation. The juice does not give us salvation. But by partaking of these things, we remember Him, we worship Him, and we thank Him. This is what Paul was speaking about in 1 Corinthians 11 23 for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he break it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me and after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped say this cup is the new testament in my blood this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup ye do show the lord's death till he come And so, two suppers are presented in Luke 22. One is the Passover supper, and the second is the institution of the Lord's table, whereby we might have communion with Him. And all of this from the loving heart of Jesus who said, I desired to have this table with you before I suffer, before they put the nails in my hands, before they put the nails in my feet, before they put the crown of thorns in my head. I've been really looking forward to, I've been desiring to be with you before I suffer. Jesus, with a calming presence, is letting his disciples know of his love for them. But as Jesus in this moment at this table is with his disciples, he secondly is considering the weakness of the disciples. He, as all-knowing God, is aware of who is at the table with him. He is aware of who is in this church today. He knows the sincerity of our heart. He knows the depth of our commitment. And think about what we see before us here this morning. There is one that is with him whose name is Judas Iscariot. Of all people, verse 21 says, But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me 
on the table. Verse 23, and they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. Here we see that Jesus is aware of the fact that one of the men that would betray him is actually there at the table. His hand is on the table, and Jesus is looking into the eyes of Judas Iscariot. There's another few disciples there with him. Verse 24 tells us, There was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. Now think of this. Jesus is at the table, the last supper before his death, and one of the ones at the table is going to sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. And then these others at the table are having an argument about who's the greatest. Jesus, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? When you take over and when you punish these Romans, will I be a general? Will I be a colonel? Will I sit at your right hand? They were so full of pride, they did not even take into account the fact that Jesus was about to die. They're sitting there arguing over what would their position be in the table. And by the way, Jesus is going to go to the cross and die for these people. Judas, Peter, James, John. Speaking of Peter, the Bible tells us that Peter would actually deny the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us this in verse number 31 of this same chapter. The Bible says in verse 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to sift you and to have you and sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Peter was so full of pride, he said, Jesus, I will never offend you. And Jesus said, Peter, before the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny me. Lester Roloff once said, you can get too big for God, but you can't ever get too small for God. And Peter had gotten too big in his own eyes for God. It's amazing to me that Jesus Christ is sitting at a table with men so full of pride, with men full of sin, with one man who wasn't even a true believer, and yet he sits there with them, loving them, and preparing them for the fact that he would die on the cross. And not only did Jesus feed them, not only did he love them, but the Bible tells us in John 13 and verse 14, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Jesus literally washed their feet. He fed them. He loved them. He washed their feet. All of this was done to prepare them for how to remember Him, how to serve one another, how to be a part of His spiritual kingdom. What an amazing Savior we serve today. What a wonderful Savior who knew not only Judas's faults and Peter's faults and John's faults and James' faults and Thomas's faults. He not only knew the faults of his disciples sitting at that table, he knows our faults today. He knows who is covetous. He knows who is lustful. He knows who has the wrong attitude or the wrong spirit. He knows who is unforgiving. And he still invited us to his table and he loves us today. What amazing love Jesus gives to this world and to you and to me. He was loving in his preparation. But then I want you to see secondly that Jesus was loving in his surrender. I want you to see his loving surrender as he makes this journey to the cross. And we'll be studying this journey the next few weeks. Notice in verse 39, the Bible says, And he came out, and he, and he was wont, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And, he, and when he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. As this evening progresses, Jesus makes his way to what is known as the Garden of Gethsemane. As he enters into the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of the Foot of Ol- uh, on the, uh, the foot of the Mount of Olives, Jesus is there with his disciples in this familiar place where they oft retreated. The Bible tells us that Jesus looked at his disciples and he said to them, 
I want you to pray here. I'll go a little farther ahead, but I want you to pray here. And then Jesus comes back to them in Matthew 26 and verse 40. And he comes to his disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus has now left the Passover dinner. He makes his way to the Garden of Gethsemane, needing more than ever the support of his disciples. And while he is praying to the Father, they are sleeping not too far away. I want you to notice our Lord's request in verse 42. He simply says, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Father, please remove it. Take it away. Take this cup from me. He comes to the Father, realizing what is about to take place. Realizing not only the nails that would come into his body, the crown of thorns that would pierce him, but perhaps more than that, realizing the sin of those at the table. Why, that Judas Iscariot. Why, of that Peter and John. And, and then looking ahead, perhaps, to your sin and mine and saying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. You see, the Bible says, He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God through him. Jesus, who never sinned. Jesus Christ, who lived a perfectly sinless life. Jesus now is about to take upon himself all of our sin. And so, in light of that, in the garden, he says, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. The Bible says as he prayed this prayer, he was in great agony. The Bible says that he was filled with sorrow. The Bible tells us that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, the capillaries in his forehead, bursting with the stress, now mingling down with the sweat as he prays, Father, let this cup pass from me. There might be something in your life today that you wish you didn't have to go through, something that you would like the Lord to remove, and yet we see a great picture of surrender our Lord's request, but we see our Lord's relinquishment. How that He relinquishes this to the Father. The Bible tells us in Matthew 26 and verse 42, He relinquishes His will to the Father. And He says there, as well as in Mark 14, 36, Nevertheless, not what I will, but what Thou wilt. Have you come to that place in your life where you said to the Father regarding your trial, Father, not my will, but Your will be done. And this is where Jesus is. He's, he's saying, Father, if it's possible, take this from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He is accepting what God the Father has placed before him, what was determined in eternity past. Uh, he is now ready to go to the cross of Calvary. Turn, if you would, or look in your notes to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Hebrews 12, 2. Notice what it says. Looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Many people, this is where the battle is being fought. It's in their minds. They get weary in their mind. They say, I can't handle this another day. I just, this is too much stress on me. My family can't handle this. And, and, and they almost want to throw in the towel and quit. But the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 3, consider him that endured the contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Jesus Christ, while he faced this great trial and great trauma of the cross, the Bible tells us, nevertheless, he endured it for you and for me and when you're feeling like you can't go on another step I would not point you first and foremost to another human being and say follow them I would point you first and foremost to the Lord Jesus himself and tell you that Jesus Christ is our greatest example for endurance in time of difficulty 
having prayed and now having determined to follow the Father's will, Jesus heads to the front of the garden where He will face His betrayer, Judas, and where He will be arrested. I see Jesus loving us in preparation. I see Jesus loving us in a time of surrender at the garden. But notice finally, Jesus loving us when facing great adversity. Loving us when facing great adversity. As we close this morning, I want you to go back to Luke 22 and to the first portion of this chapter, verse 1. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priest and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot. Let me pause here and say, Judas was not a saved man. Satan cannot enter a saved man. If you are saved, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. But Satan entered Judas Iscariot, uh, being of the number of the twelve. Let me say that Satan entered Judas Iscariot. And let me also draw this to your attention that Judas Iscariot was not a saved man. He was a member of the Twelve. He carried the bag. He had an official position. I say to you this morning, it is possible to be a member of a church, to hold an office in a church, and still not be saved. It is possible to have religion and be lost. Judas Iscariot had religion, but he was lost and on his way to a Christless hell. Please, my friend, do not misunderstand and think that membership in the church is what gets you to heaven. Judas Iscariot was not on his way to heaven. And yet the Bible tells us that he plotted against Jesus that he might betray him. Verse 5 says, The chief priests were glad, and they covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him. In other words, he said something like this, I'll let you know right where he's going. I know where he hangs out with his disciples. We'll catch him when he's not with a big crowd of his disciples in the sense of a large crowd. We'll find him at just the right time and I'll show him to you. I'll betray him with a kiss. You give me the money. The job will be done. This was Judas's plan. He makes the plot against Christ. He's plotting with the religious leaders in verses 1 and 2. The Sanhedrin as they are known. They would have been accompanied by the Roman soldiers from the Tower of Antonia, which was uh, one of the uh, areas in Jerusalem dedicated for the use of the Romans. And the soldiers from this particular tower would come for political uh, persecution of the Jews at the request of the chief priest. And here we see the religious leaders beckoning these soldiers to the Garden of Gethsemane. We find Judas Iscariot with them. They're plotting against the Lord Jesus. Jesus knew all of this was unfolding, but he never stopped loving Judas. He never stopped loving his persecutors. In fact, through it all, he displayed his power and his love. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 18 for just a moment. John chapter 18. I want you to see the power of Jesus in this moment of his betrayal. John 18, and you'll see in verse number 4, the Bible says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? He he knew that they were coming for him. Yet he goes and he approaches them and says, Whom seek ye? They say in verse number 5, We seek Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Here he claims to be God in the flesh. I am the I am that I am. In verse number 6, as soon as they had, as he had said this unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Here we see the power of the name of Jesus Christ. He says, I am. And when he says this, they fall backward. There in the Garden of Gethsemane. So often man thinks he's in control. But make no mistake about this fact as we study the love of Jesus. Every step of Jesus to the cross was a step in which he was fully under control. These Roman soldiers were not killing Jesus. Jesus was voluntarily giving his life for our sin. And he was so powerful that the mention of his name caused them to go backward. The plot against Christ is seen. The power of Christ is seen 
It is seen in His passion for all men. And and notice His passion in verse 10. The Bible says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. You've heard this story, perhaps, how that Peter takes his sword. He's going to save the day. Lord, I'll fight for you. And he swings that sword. By the way, folks, he was not aiming for the ear. Nobody's that good swinging wildly like he was swinging. He was swinging for something larger, was he not? And he cuts off the ear from Malchus. And the Bible tells us here, that the servant's name was Malchus. Verse 11, And then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? He said, Peter, you're not going to fight our way out of this. I'm here to do the will of the Father. Luke 22 and verse 51 says that Jesus went to Malchus and he touched his ear and he healed his ear. Now, Malchus was the servant of the man who wanted to murder Jesus Christ. Malchus was the enemy of Jesus, and yet every step to the cross was a step of love. Jesus could have let Malchus bleed out. Jesus could have taken the life of Malchus. Jesus could have said, good job, Peter, but instead he healed Malchus, showing his love for a lost and dying world. Not only did he heal Malchus, He even treated Judas Iscariot kindly. I don't know about you, but if I would have been at that Passover table, I might have said, one of you is going to betray me, and we all know it's you, Judas. (laughs) Right? I might have said to Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter, don't take Malchus' ear off. Take Judas' head off. That might have been my attitude or your attitude, but not the Lord. In fact, notice what the Lord says in your notes there in Luke 22. It says he healed Malchus's ear, 22, 51. And then in Matthew 26, I want you to see what he says to Judas, verse 48. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold, fa- hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, listen to this, Friend, friend, wherefore art thou come? Jesus didn't say, take his head off. Jesus didn't say, you are a wicked man. He looks at Judas and says, friend, wherefore art thou come? I don't know about you, that's convicting to me. So many people today, they want to get even. They want to give a piece of their mind. So many people today, they want to gossip about someone. They want to go on a rant. They want to get on the internet and rant. Jesus teaches us what forgiveness is like. Jesus says, I know Judas will betray me. I know Peter, James, and John, all they care about is who's the greatest. I know Peter, when the cock crows, he's going to even deny me. I know Malchus hates me, but I love them. And I'm here in love trying to prepare them for eternity. How convicting is the forgiveness and the love of Jesus. And the Bible says that we are to forgive one another even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us. How many of you this morning are thankful that Jesus Christ has forgiven you? God says, I want you to forgive others just like I have forgiven you. You say, well, my husband doesn't deserve it. That school teacher doesn't deserve it. That person, wait a minute. It's not based on our forgiveness. It's based on Jesus Christ's love. Jesus displays it for us here. The Bible says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. This is what Jesus is doing. And as we approach Resurrection Sunday, we are Baptists. We don't put ashes on our head to remember the love of Jesus. But something deep in your heart these next few weeks should say, Lord, help me to love you more. Help me to remember that when I didn't deserve your love, still you loved me. Help me to remember that you love Judas and you love Peter and you love these disciples and you love this whole world. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Let us fall more deeply in love with him in the days ahead. Courageous love is a preparing love. Jesus came to prepare his disciples to teach them how to face eternity. 
But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. God said, I loved you even when I knew you were a sinner. I loved you before you ever were born. I knew you and I loved you and I died on the cross for you. And if you one time were enemies, now you can be reconciled to God by the blood that I shed on the cross of Calvary. What a wonderful Savior to know that we were sinners and to still die on the cross for our sin. Something in me sitting at that table, I might have thought to myself after three and a half years, Peter, James, and John, this is your question. Who's the greatest? Peter, after all these lessons, you're going to deny me? Judas, you're not even saved yet? I might have said, Father, they're not worth it. But that's not what he said. Not my will, but thine be done. And he went to Calvary with a heart of love for you and a heart of love for me. Last night I was preaching the ordination service for Keegan Moodley. Keegan and Amabel were students here at West Coast. That's Keegan there on the top left. On the bottom left here, some of the board members of our college who live in Australia. And Keegan is seen here with his ordination certificate. He and his wife, they'll be starting a church in a few weeks. I hope you'll pray for them. They love Lancaster Baptist Church, and they wanted to thank you for your investment in their life. We'll be supporting them from our missions program as they start this church. But what impressed me about the ordination service was not just the great crowd or the wonderful spirit or this great candidate here, Brother Keegan. What impressed me was that Keegan Moodley brought nine unsaved friends to his ordination service. Nine unsaved friends. In other words, he wasn't going to wait till he got into the ministry to start doing the work of the Lord. And he texted me the day before. He said, now, Pastor, I know in ordination service you're going to preach mostly to me, but I'm bringing these friends, so please don't forget to preach the gospel to them. Well, that was already in my notes, amen? I'd already planned to preach the gospel. As I preached the gospel that evening, he had some of his friends who came to trust Christ as Savior. There was one man speaking to the assistant pastor. He was saying, Pastor Chapel said that we can know that we're on our way to heaven. He, he said, I, I've been to church. I've done some things. They started asking him, what's your background? What's your understanding of Jesus? And, 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 and uh, he said, look. He said, I just got baptized last Sunday at the Hillsong Church, but I don't know that I'm on my way to heaven. And the preacher said, you can know you're on your way to heaven, and I want to know that. And that assistant pastor took him to the altar and opened the Bible, and after a few moments, that man prayed and accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Do you understand tonight? You could, like Judas, be a member of a church. You could, like Judas... This morning, do you understand? You could have an office. Do you understand? You could be baptized in a church. These are not the things that bring salvation. The only thing that brings salvation is faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. And Jesus says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. If you will turn to Christ alone, if you'll have a change of mind about yourself, if you'll just say, Lord, I realize I'm not all that great. I'm a sinner. I realize, Lord, that without you there's no hope and that you shed your blood on the cross for my sin. And if you'll turn to Jesus and call upon him to be your Savior, he will come into your life and he will give you eternal life. It is only by the way of the cross. We used to sing when I was a little boy, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's only by the blood. And Jesus loves us enough with such courageous love to say, if you'll come to me, and believe on my work at Calvary, you too can know that you are saved.